Welcome to Business Talks to Sister Gok. I'm Becca, and today's podcast episode title is How Business Tycoons Build Wealth in Minnesota. And today I have a guest with me, Aaron Brown. He is actually the co-host of the podcast Power in the Wilderness and actually author of a new book coming out about a celebrity from 100 years ago. So I definitely want him to tell me a little bit about that. But thank you so much for being with me today. Thanks, Becca. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So the reason I want to do this story is because I listened to your podcast, Power in the Wilderness, and it's history based, by the way, this series that Aaron and I are doing is all about um, history. And I was struck by how many layers of entrepreneurship and big business and then economic changes like kind of all played together. And a lot of what was happening in Minnesota specifically was being talked about in New York City because it was kind of crazy. And it, I know that you know a lot about this. So tell me a little bit about first why you know these things and what was going on a hundred years ago. Yeah. Well, the why is very boring. I, I've been reading microfilm in my basement for many years and it's, <laughs> you it's a process. A lot of newspapers. So, <laughs> yeah. A lot of newspapers, but not today's newspapers. Uh, I know as much about the um, 1924 presidential election as I, I will about the 2024 election that will come up later. So, um, uh, but no, it's it's um, a lot of history has happened in Minnesota, but but it's all connected to the broader story of really American American history and American industry, which is as we learned in the 20th century, part of the world story about how businesses and corporations work, and that's really what my story. Uh, is under the underlayment of my story that I told about this guy, Victor Power from, from a hundred years ago uh, is the story of how corporate America became what we know it today. Mm -hmm. And it it all begins back in this time with U S steel, the largest, the first billion dollar corporation and the first super corporation to exist in in the world. And so uh, my story is about that. But even before U.S. Steel, the seeds of, of you know, the, the system, the, the America's capitalist system um, really started in, in the 1800s. I'd say the modern era starts in the, in the 1800s. Uh, of course, you know, people lived mostly agrarian life in the early history of the United States. Mm -hmm. Uh, More people lived in the country and worked on farms than lived in the city and worked in factories. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then of course the industrial era, industrial age is where all those people left the farms and became factory workers or, or, or worked in city. And that changed the face of our landscape and our geography. But there were these, large players, these big figures of this time who were part of this happening. Mm. And um, you mentioned, of course, I think it's interesting for anyone, not just those who live in Minnesota or Northern Minnesota, but if you're in Northern Minnesota, you should know that, you know, the, the most prosperous people who ever took money from this area out of the resources that were here uh, were the children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren of some very lucky people. Uh, uh, um, because we all think about business we think about innovation Mm -hmm. doing doing this and we also think about hard work and those are those are all very important parts of business but then there's this third part of this third leg of the stool luck and what happened was after the civil war uh when and of course having vast amount of territory that had just been taken from the Native Americans all over the continent, um, and was being parceled off by the federal government and then local governments, state governments. Um, but as it was being parceled off and sold uh, to mostly timber developers here, um, people off in these other cities, Chicago, New York, out east, would look at a map and see these vast territories and land for sale. And they'd have some reports about these enormous white pine timbers that could be located on this land. And so they'd they'd buy the land pretty cheap. The reason it was cheap is because, okay, you own that land. How are you going to get those white Mm -hmm. pine logs out of there? What are you going to do with it? Down to the sawmill. What are you going to do with it? You're going to go get that, uh, that, uh, you know, 95 to 100 foot white pine. You're going to, you're going to pull it down yourself. Uh, What are you going to do? You got to hire people. You got to get a transportation system. It's pretty elaborate, but the, people were taking a shot kind of like the early stages of any business trend, you know, the, some up and comers like, yo, I'm going to get into that, 
that Midwest or that Northwest, they call it the Northwest forests, because yeah, I can't realize the profits right away, but I'm buying in now to get in on this. And some of the people um, who did this uh, were some names you might've heard. Pillsbury, for instance, um, Boeing is another. Um, these are guys um, who, whose name is synonymous with other things, flour, for instance, for Pillsbury, mm-hmm. airplanes for Boeing. I mostly think of but, the Pillsbury Doughboy. Just oh, the Pillsbury Doughboy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's him. But before that, before uh, uh-huh. uh, uh, before the Pillsbury Doughboy, and and even the flour mills in Minneapolis, uh, the Pillsbury family was investing in logging interests in northern mm-hmm. Minnesota, and um, in doing that, they eventually figured out how to do what they wanted, which was cut down all those trees and sell them for a a nice profit. Mm -hmm. That was a very successful business move for them. Uh, But what they did not realize, and why I say they were very lucky, is that beneath these timbers was Mm -hmm. the world's, one of the world's greatest sources of natural iron ore in, in, in all the world. So they didn't know that when they bought it. And when, when they realized that they owned this land that had this rich iron ore underneath it, uh, they realized that they had, you know, won, won the, the business lottery. You know, they, they now, um, and still in many cases, possess the mineral rights to this rich source of iron that's actually still being mined even today. And mm-hmm. so uh, when we look at... Um, I mean, the tycoons, as we might call them, uh, uh, they they got in on this land kind of lucky lucky style. And um, so, what does Pillsbury do? They they have a lot of capital now that they can spend on expanding uh, their other businesses in Minneapolis, their, their flower businesses. Boeing, uh, Wilhelm Boeing from Germany, he he actually died quite young, but he his son uh, William uh, inherited all of that beautiful money and land from from northern minnesota and um he became a wealthy young playboy who got really interested in flying these new contraptions called airplanes Mm -hmm. and uh in in the process of buying his first airplane flew it across country from the east coast up to pacific northwest where he owned a boat company in washington state and he crashes his nice new toy uh (laughs) and and of course there are no part stores for airplanes Mm because it's the first airplane in that area and so uh, he uh, decides to start fixing up his boat company uh, to start making airplane parts so he can fly his airplane again and sure enough these are pretty easy to make I bet I could make my own and and that's how Boeing um, the aircraft company uh, started and and those are just two examples yeah I know I was like we haven't even gotten to the other one (laughs) yeah um you know, and, and that's, so that's the under underscore of this whole thing is these people got really lucky. And then some very big businessmen were very cutthroat strategic. And I'd say that's the other name names you may have heard of um, John D. Rockefeller, for instance, mm-hmm. um, you know, kind of synonymous with the, the term robber baron, uh, the mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, John, and Andrew Carnegie being another, and they were competitors in many ways in their era. And this would be the late 1800s. John Rockefeller is an oil man. He famously, you know, monopolized the oil business at right at the time we started using lots and lots of oil and became very, very wealthy. And Standard Oil was like this, the poster boy for monopolies and mm-hmm. the dangers of monopolies. The antitrust um, legislation was often targeted at Standard Oil and John Rockefeller. But at the same time, Andrew Carnegie is a big steel man. He's making steel. And um, John Rockefeller is always investing and finding things. He ended up investing in this group of brothers and and cousins, uh, the Merritt brothers, uh, who were uh, um, exploring the iron ore that was discovered in northern Minnesota in the early 1890s. And um, as an investor, he realizes what he's got, but he also is a distant you know, landlord, so to speak. And um, mm-hmm. he ends up, um, some would say the Merritt family certainly claimed that he exploits them and um, gets them to sign into a deal bec- by offering very little collateral on, on a different thing. Uh, and he gets a big share of Merritt Brothers iron ore business. And 
eventually crowds them out and and because of their debts to him he mm. ends up controlling the vast uh, portion of iron ore land in northern Minnesota on the Masabi Iron Range. And as a result, uh, without even, again, without really trying that hard personally, just his large organization had it kind of figured out, he ends up holding this very rich iron ore. Well, it's the same problem as the trees. How do you get it out of here mm -hmm. when, it, when it's a very remote place? Well, Rockefeller puts in his money and he builds one of the world-class shipping centers and, and shipping systems for shipping iron ore to the steel mills. And uh, he, he's growing and competing with Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie and him are warring with one another for a short time. And it's, it's determined that it's, this isn't going to work um, for America. This isn't going to work for our, 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 our industrial system to have these kind of guys fighting with each other. And so JP Morgan, who is a big, another name you've heard, um, he's a big money man. He's going to gather some capital. His, his main guy, Albert Gary, is going to lead the operation and he's going to get to form this super corporation. He's going to merge the interests of Rockefeller and Carnegie into U.S. Steel. And in doing so, uh, Ro Rockefeller and Carnegie instantly become the richest men on earth. Um, mm. they, 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 uh, I mean, they made a lot of money. These were rich dudes already. Mm -hmm. But they they became super rich off of off of what this transaction did. And it sets off the beginning of what we would might call the corporate era of of these large, almost invincible corporations that have that are vertically integrated, that have every every aspect of their their business all interconnected. And um, the scale of it is so, mm -hmm. so much vaster than anything that had been seen before. I mean, they're mm -hmm. using basic business techniques, but they're, you know, you know, they're trying to sell things profitably, acquire goods cheaply and sell them profitably, et cetera. But they're, they're at a scale that's never been heard of before. Mm -hmm. Again, that story starts right here in, in Northern Minnesota. And, and, and again, with the luck of finding, this mineral resource uh, under under land that was bought under different pretenses. Yeah. So I feel like that's really interesting too, in, in the aspect of like the infrastructure that was needed to, I mean, if you talk about starting up a mine in general, even mm -hmm. today, it's millions of dollars if they have a shutdown, yeah. right? Just for yeah. a week or whatever. And so when, when they're kind of having all of this, like, well, how do we do this and how do we build it? In, in some ways, a lot of it would have never been mined or we wouldn't have been able to have the steel and everything else if mm -hmm. somebody hadn't had the resources to be able to get it started, right? But at it's the a... same time, I mean, the aspect of like robber mm -hmm. baron, like what is that definition? And what is, mm -hmm. <laughs> tell me a yeah. little bit about what how they well, got well, there. <laughs> that's the other term you hear from this era, the robber barons. Of course, barons is referring to the fact that these are very powerful people who mm -hmm. almost seem to have um, a, 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 a heredity based authority in that, you know, John Rockefeller Jr. is the guy who takes over and the Rockefellers continue to be important in, in years that come. Um, and so what what made them barons? Well, that's where the term robber comes in. They, <laughs> right. um, you know, and, and there's a there's a large amount of research on John D. Rockefeller and his techniques and, 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 and strategies. You can say, and I think you did a good job pointing out that um, these guys, you know, plundered in many ways, what we would call plundering. They exploited weaknesses in their competition. They found resources and took them from people who were not capitalized to take advantage of them themselves, like mm -hmm. the Merits, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, in northern Minnesota. Uh, and, and that's all bad. We would say, oh, that makes them bad people. But as you point out, you know, I don't know that the Misabi Iron Range would have been mined as quickly. I don't know that it would have been ready to mine the ore that we used in World War I, for instance, were it not for the capital John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie put into it, and that mm -hmm. U.S. Steel then resultingly put into it. Um, would we have had the shipping system? They had to build all new ships. Mm -hmm. they, you know, would that have happened without John D. Rockefeller? I, I mean, someone would have eventually done it, but we don't know how long it would have taken. So 
So you can kind of look at this and say, well, historically, we can make a judgment and say certain things were bad. And on the other hand, we have to say that, well, it wouldn't have happened the same way if it hadn't been done this way. So that's the stories. Like, are corporations good for America? You know, there's people arguing about that today. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that this era proves that corporations aren't inherently good, you know, or you know, they aren't like altruistic in, right. their, in their design. They're designed to uh, protect the economy, to protect investment stockholders, for instance, are much safer investing in corporations than they would have been in a thousand different individual small businesses uh, back in the day. That's how it used to be done. You'd buy a stock in a small factory in Poughkeepsie and, and you hope that factory did well. And if it did, you would, you would realize your investment. But, but now you buy stock in a company like US Steel or, or Apple or Google or, or Facebook or whoever now and um, your, 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 the corporate model protects your investment in a way that is really profound. Now, um, you know, there's a downside. There's a flip side to this whole thing, which is that these robber, so-called robber barons set a model for how some people could become very powerful and rich, mm -hmm. richer and more powerful than we could even, that the common person could even conceive of, certainly at that time and even today. I don't think most people realize how powerful people in these positions are but on the other hand um you know uh they they are the architects of the system that we all live in now and so it all kind of comes back to people buying land in northern minnesota back in the 1800s 100 maybe 130 years ago 140 years ago and um some of them hit it big and they're still hitting it big the the story i always like to tell a friend of mine was standing outside the pillsbury one of the annual meetings of the Pillsbury family. And um, he was talking to one of those folks. And these are the great grandchildren, great, great grandchildren of some of the people who made those decisions back, back in those days. And, and he asked, my friend asked the guy, like, do you guys, you, did you guys make more money off iron ore than you made off flour, which is what we all know the name Pillsbury for. And he, and he just shook his head. Yes. He, he, he nodded his head. Yes. Because, that's the foundation of the feast was mm -hmm. this lucky land purchase and then exploiting it effectively over time um, that made that made our modern system go. Yeah. So much of our economy today is these people who had the money already and then invested it wisely. They have to invest it wisely, but they they have a lot of advantages um, that other that other folks will will just not have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about, because this whole aspect of becoming the first big corporation, there was, there was no precedented rules in place, right? I mean, there was no healthcare. There was, I mean, they started yeah. implementing a lot of things. Like it sounds like they paid staff to be the doctors for the entire family mm -hmm. and, and all that kind of stuff that people didn't have access to unless the company itself provided it. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's true. The, this is the era when U.S. Steel comes to northern Minnesota. Um, we see one of the first HMO plans in the country form in Hibbing, this era, area I've been researching, um, because they, uh, they, they strike up a partnership with the local hospital that uh, if all the miners pay a certain portion of their check, a small amount of money, they could be covered if they take themselves or their families to this one hospital in town where the doctors are on retainer to take care of the mining, the miners, mm -hmm. And, and that's the early, I mean, that sounds very familiar because that's very similar to our healthcare system today. Uh, at least if you have insurance, that's kind of what it's like. Um, and of course, before that you would pay out of pocket for medical expenses, but things are much less expensive than they are now. And, um, so that, that was part of the co company strategy. It, again, just like two sides of a coin. On one hand, very good. I mean, miners get to go to the, go, go to the hospital and they, if they hurt themselves, they have care and they've already paid for it. They don't have to be destitute uh, to pay for a broken leg, for instance, or something like that. Um, 
that's great. But on the flip side of that is that only one hospital will provide mm-hmm. that care. Mm-hmm. The hospital, the hospital that the company has an interest in. Mm-hmm. And um, then the flip side of that is you are when wedded to the company, if you lose your job, you lose your health insurance. You know, and right. that's another thing that that we might find familiar today is that that decision making that goes into it's one of the things I think business um entrepreneurs face is one of the great challenges is why don't you start a business if you have all these ideas the answer is often health insurance right and Mm -hmm. and 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 so that system started back here in this time and so the company then exerts a lot of control over its workers as a result of this corporate model of of becoming they thought it was like elbert judge elbert gary the leader of u.s steel it was almost like an evangelist, especially later in life. He, he believed that he was doing God's work in making the corporate, the corporate entity U.S. Steel almost like the father of its workers. Um, mm. it, he, he, he believed that if the corporation was providing the recreation, if the corporation was providing the education, the, and the health care, and, um, and th- those workers, among other things, they weren't going to start unions because they wouldn't dare stand up to their father in this way. And they also um, wouldn't complain as much and they would, they, would, they would comply with what the company wanted them to do. They would live where the company told them to live. They, would, they wouldn't get in the way. And, and as long as they were working and you know, the money the company spent was a pittance compared to you know, what they would face if the workers you know, wanted, for instance, higher pay. And so um, they, the, the company's, this corporation, taught itself to use a little bit of honey and and a stick to get what it wanted but in the earliest years they used way more stick than honey yeah and, and, well, that's, and that's the story i tell right yeah well especially in your podcast series the power in the wilderness you talk a lot more about that aspect of how um local politicians had to step in for like there was no such thing as unemployment Right. Mm -hmm. And when you couldn't mine in the winter, nobody had a job. And and that whole aspect of can you tell me how that worked with with these big businesses when people would um, voice complaints and what kind of like pressure? uh, How did that work and and how is it all connected to one another? Mm -hmm. Well, the you know, the company was uh, involved in, in all aspects. So like we're happening to be talking about a town named Hibbing, which was next to several mines owned by U.S. Steel. And, and so U.S. Steel is, is involved in everything. They have their, their personnel are, you know, their largest employers. So their, their employees compose a great amount of people who live in the town. And so there are certain people who want to become city councilors or mayors who are loyal to the company and want the company's version of things to be the truth. Um, and then there's this other group, mostly merchants, people who are independent of the mining companies who then have their views on what the company is doing. And, and so, like you mentioned, unemployment, that was a big one. So when 70% of the town works for the mine and then the mine shuts down from November, early December through say March or April, that's five months, the coldest time of year in Minnesota, what are you going to do? Um, and what, what this village did under its mayor, Victor Power, is they, they would essentially start an unemployment program, which was based on working on, on village you know, projects over the winter. They would dig sewers in the winter just because that's when there was this huge labor pool available. And so they would pay people. They would rotate when there was too many workers who needed the money, they rotated them. So they got two weeks of work enough to pay their bills for that month mm-hmm. and to put some coal in the, in the, in the furnace and, and take care of the kids and just enough, just like unemployment isn't your full salary. They had just enough. And so that's what he did to uh, kind of counter this power that the mind showed. Mm-hmm. And I would say in my experience, there's been a lot of that even today, just in, in terms of the shifts of when mm-hmm. the mines lay off, all of a sudden we have tons of people available for construction projects, but because we don't have the economic ability to pay for those yep. construction projects, then nothing gets, or they have to go elsewhere to build things for other communities. So, uh, yeah. And so tell me how people can find you because yeah. I want to make sure that it gets in this episode. Cool. So you can find me at my website, minnesotabrown.com, all one word, full, full state name spelled out. 
Uh, that's my where I write, and you can read my work there. You can also find me at, at Minnesota Brown as my Twitter handle, or powerinthewilderness.com is where you can find the podcast that tells this story about the era we're talking about. And that's something I did with Carl Jacob. And you can look for my book, probably of the same name, <laughs> sometime next year. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being with me today. I have really enjoyed this conversation. <laughs> and oh, I think you. it's so interesting how all of that we know today is kind of all connected back to these original businesses. And mm -hmm. honestly, a lot of, I mean, the Midwest was the West of the time before they, the gold rush and all of that. So um, let's, let's get into um, how, some okay, this is a story that we kind of were talking a little bit beforehand in the gawk. And <laughs> um, we were talking about how wedding there's a wedding that happened close to where you live, and and not, not a lot has changed in terms of culture for the fact that people like this is big news where we lived, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so, this a couple summers ago. I went to a wedding that the church, it looked like was under construction when I got there. And, uh, and you heard about this right before yeah. or did you, oh, hear about everybody it? in my neighborhood heard about it? We, we saw it, you know, it's this prominent site along this major road in our, our neighborhood out here. And, and it was, uh, it had a hole in it. You drove by it one day and there was a, <laughs> a giant hole yeah. in the church. Yeah. Well, I got there the day after it happened for this wedding. And I thought, why would they have a wedding at a church under construction? Why is there a backhoe here? Well, during the wedding, we found out that it was actually a drunk driver that went off the road through the parking lot and through the middle of the church <laughs> oh. that night. And oh, I can't like to this day, I think that we still have a lot of like these community, like, oh, did you hear what happened? And it's very similar to a hundred years ago in terms of like what makes big news. <laughs> well, one of the big stories a um, hundred years ago was inhibiting a cabbage man with a truck full of baskets of cabbages. If you can just imagine the, the old okay. days where these wicker baskets full of cabbages and a basket fell off the big pile of wicker baskets and and all the cabbages went everywhere in the basket landed on his head while he was driving and he lost control of his vehicle and he he, oh. he hit a guy it, it was grim it was a grim scene but all because of a basket of cabbages you know and so you know, these are the stories of our times out in, in the rural parts of the world I guess I bet that made the newspaper too as it like did. a big accident did. yeah yep. <laughs> Well, I am so thankful that we were able to talk a little bit about tycoons today. And, and I know that there's so much more that you talk about what they did and how they did it in your podcast. So listeners definitely check that out power in the wilderness. And if you enjoy listening to this episode, you should give it a review on Spotify and I'll see you next week.